Welcome each and every one of you to our annual Interreligious Institute lecture. I'd like to uh, uh, thank each and every one of you for joining us this evening. I'm just going to give uh, some brief opening remarks and then uh, we will move right along with the program. So the first thing I'd like to say is um, we're so glad you're here because you're helping us continue the significant work that was begun with the Interreligious Institute. The Interreligious Institute uh, was a project that was begun initially with a generous grant from the Luce Foundation, but then a number of donors joined us in the work of bringing not only inter work in terms of interreligious understanding, but actually trying to transform the seminary so that we might be engaged in the significant work of cultivating and developing religious leaders who, while standing in the integrity of their own traditions, learn about others so that they might be a part of the work of building a new world. We've done the work of the Interreligious Institute, both through speakers that we've had this annual lecture, as well as through a program of podcasts that we've had and a number of significant activities. Uh, we'll speak more about those activities to begin with, but we're so glad that you joined us this evening so that we're able to continue the work and continue to grow the work and capacity that was begun uh, with the founding of the Interreligious Institute. So I'm going to invite our uh, shaman professor of uh, Jewish studies, Rabbi Rachel Mikva, to give us an opening reflection. And once again, thank you all so much for being in attendance this evening. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Um, I am so excited about tonight and think uh, of the little seeds that you plant, right? And how they grow. Because even before the Interreligious Institute, right? There was the Center uh, for Jewish, Christian and Islamic Studies and all the work that that did and things just keep growing. It's, it's uh, inspiring. So first I have to tell you that Wajahat Ali's title for tonight, Invest in Hope, But Tie Your Camel First, is my favorite title ever for a program. It made me smile, of course, which is really a treasure right now in this struggling world. And then it made me think of a Jewish teaching from a first century rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. It's reported that he taught, if you have a sapling in your hand and you're in the middle of planting it and someone should say to you that the Messiah has come, stay and complete the planting first and then go greet the Messiah. And I love this teaching because it invests in hope, right? The idea that the Messiah has perhaps come, but it doesn't abandon the work that we need to do in the meantime. It, is it because the report might be wrong? Maybe, but I prefer to think that the very possibility of the Messiah's arrival is dependent upon each act of repair that we do in this world, each act of beauty that we contribute, each act of goodness that we embody. And it aligns with the teaching that's generally attributed to Mahatma Gandhi that we should be the change we want to see in the world. So, that in turn made me think of a poem by Danny Siegel written back in the 1970s. And I close my brief reflection by sharing with you his words. If you always assume the person sitting next to you is the Messiah waiting for some simple human kindness, you will soon come to weigh your words and watch your hands. And if the person chooses not to be revealed in your lifetime, it will not matter. Thank you, Dr. Mikva. And thank you, Dr. Ray. Um, those are beautiful thoughts to uh, start us, Dr. Mikva. My name is Kim Schultz and I am the creative coordinator uh, at the Interreligious Institute and I'm so happy to um, be here with you all tonight as well. And just want to thank you all for joining us. Um, and I'm gonna be acting as an MC tonight, guiding us through this evening. 
hopefully, fingers crossed, and what an evening we have planned for you. We have awards, live poetry, spoken word, and what will no doubt be a very compelling talk by our keynote speaker, Wajahat Ali. So um, before we begin, uh, just a couple housekeeping items. Um, if you are able to, we would love for you to have your cameras on. I know some of you are eating and doing other things and aren't camera ready, but if it's at all possible, uh, it's really great in this world of Zoom to see faces um, and is helpful for all of our speakers. Um, so if you are willing or able to do that, that would be wonderful. Um, secondly, if your box says something other than your name, it's also really useful to change that to your name, i.e. iPad 4. Um, then we can engage with each other as people. So if you wouldn't mind changing that to your name as well. Uh, and let's see, lastly, you should be muted and you can remain muted until it's time for um, Q&A. And at that point, um, we will be utilizing the chat. And so some of you haven't noticed the chat, the chat is open and already active. So um, feel free to keep that chat active. I know that uh, we all, and I think now that we're all so accustomed to this uh, world, um, check the chats and so feel free to put responses and comments and questions throughout the evening in the chat um, and we can uh, all respond to those things and also when it comes time later in the evening for a Q&A you can feel free to put questions in the chat as well or unmute yourself and we will um, have real live people talking as well. Uh, so I think those are all the nuts and bolts that we need for tonight. Um, and again, uh, Dr. Mikva, so happy to have you with us. Dr. Mikva, by the way, is the Rabbi Herman E. Shulman Chair and Professor of Jewish Studies and Senior Faculty Fellow of the Interreligious Institute. So we're always glad to have Dr. Mikva with us. And at this point, I would like to introduce a new face. I would like to introduce Reverend Shelby Perez, who will offer a brief reflection on her time at CTS and how the interreligious commitments embodied by CTS shaped her. Reverend Shelby graduated from CTS with a Master of Divinity with a concentration in interreligious studies in 2019. And she is currently working uh, as a mission coworker in partnership with the Episcopalian Diocese of Jerusalem and the Global Ministries in the development of an interreligious engagement center, that's exciting, in Ramallah. So uh, we are so happy um, to have Shelby with us and she's gonna share a brief reflection. Thank you. Um, so. Thank you, Kim. Uh, as I as it was mentioned, I graduated from CTS in 2019. And before that, I studied religion at Emory University in a secular setting. So when I looked for seminaries, having a place where I could study many religions and interreligiously was very important to me. And that's an opportunity CTS offered and was open about pretty, pretty immediately. And I really had no idea what I was getting myself into when I took that right. leap. Um, so one of my favorite things about CTS was the fact that the commitments that CTS holds, they work into all of the coursework. It, they came up repeatedly throughout my classes and my time at CTS. One of those commitments was that in a global context of religious conflicts and society structured by Christian privilege to joyously embrace religious diversity, expanding groundbreaking work in Jewish, Christian and Islamic studies to advance understanding and collaboration among the rich multiplicity of spiritual traditions and life stances. I think that statement has been updated since I applied, but it fits still. Um, it, it's reminiscent of what I read. Um, and in my time at CTS, that was a commitment that was lived out in the curriculum and in the student body and in the programming. And of course, there's always room for growth within these commitments. And students were encouraged to question and challenge and that culture was normalized. And that normalization helped us to, or at least me, um, learn that that was a normal way in which to interact with the systems and institutions I am in and work within beyond and at CTS. And I have to say my courses especially helped me to deconstruct what I now see as Christian privilege. And the ones that did that most effectively were the ones taught by professors from different traditions and life stances. And the courses on interreligious engagement that I took and on different traditions and life stances were 
we were challenged to interrogate our own perspectives. Um, Christianity, where Christianity is privileged in language and in universal concepts and in framing of topics discussed as religious studies. We were also required to step out of those comfort zones that we have in engaging in interreligious uh, organizations within our own communities, as well as stepping into religious communities that were different from our own and not just stepping into them, but researching and learning about them and building ongoing relationships with them. And those expectations went beyond one class. They were repeated with across a number of my courses. And this continual revisitation cemented this pattern of thinking and allowed me to begin to approach the way I learned about religion in a new way. And when it came, came time for me to construct my theology, that was at the forefront of my mind. And I focused on the dismantling of Christian supremacy in my own theology, as well as how it's a priority in my theological work outside of CTS. And I used the tools I learned along the way at CTS to help me do that research and to write and construct that theology. And I now have the tools to educate others and develop programming to facilitate interreligious engagement and dismantle these ideas within myself and commit to questioning and challenging these systems and institutions upholding Christian supremacy because of my education at CTS, where these commitments and inclusion of these commitments throughout the coursework and a curriculum that challenged Christian privilege was valued. And of course, there's always room for growth and a more religiously diverse student body and faculty can only improve this commitment to rich multiplicity. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Shelby. That was beautiful. Thank you for that reflection. And now it is my great honor to turn it over to my colleague, the director of the Interreligious Institute, Lisa Zook, who will be awarding this year's Rabbi Herman E. Shalman Award. All yours, Lisa. Good evening, everyone. In honor and remembrance of Rabbi Herman E. Shalman and his dedication to interreligious engagement, the Interreligious Institute established the annual Shalman Interreligious Leadership Award in 2017. And it is my pleasure this evening to present the 2021 Shalman Interreligious Leadership Award to Master of Divinity student, Jeff Lisa Simpson. Before turning to Jeff Lisa, I want to share a bit of background about this award, the life of Rabbi Shalman, and the legacy contained therein. Born in 1916 in Munich, Germany, Rabbi Shalman came to America in 1935 as a refugee from the Nazi regime as part of a rescue program of the Reform Movement Seminary Hebrew Union College. After studying and ordination, he served as a congregational rabbi in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and then came to Chicago to be the Midwest director of the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. In 1956, he took the post as senior rabbi at Chicago's Emanuel Congregation, where he served for the next 30 years. Throughout the more than seven decades of his long career, Rabbi Shalman was committed to interreligious understanding and the promotion of a peaceful world. He forged deep friendships with spiritual leaders here in Chicago enriching his faith and the city he called home. Recognizing that religious leaders must be equipped to guide people through our complex multi-faith context, he taught in Christian theological seminaries for over 50 years, including here at Chicago Theological Seminary from 1987 until 2009. Even after that time, he remained involved at CTS and during my tenure as a student from 2008 to 2012, Rabbi Shalman was a guest lecturer in many CTS courses. I especially rem remember his lecture in a course on forgiveness taught by Dow Edgerton and Susan Thistlethwaite. Listening to Rabbi Shalman's thoughts on forgiveness and the possibility of forgiveness as a survivor of the Shoah remains one of my most powerful CTS classroom experiences. 
In 2009, CTS established the Rabbi Herman E. Shalman Chair of Jewish Studies, bringing Rabbi Dr. Rachel Mikva to our community and deepening our commitment to interreligious engagement. Though he passed away in 2017 at the age of 100, Rabbi Shalman's legacy continues here at CTS, both in and out of the classroom. This award is one way we foster student interreligious leadership in society. Each year, students are invited to offer proposals for interreligious initiatives that are both contextually centered and issue specific. One, winter, one winner is selected annually and they receive a cash prize along with a micro grant to support their initiative. So I am delighted this evening to recognize Jeff Lisa Simpson as this year's Shalman winner. Simpson's winning proposal will develop a summit for religious leaders in the Quad City metropolitan area of Illinois and Iowa where Simpson resides. The summit will address transgender issues and empower religious leaders from multiple faiths to advocate and respond to the needs of the transgender community. Simpson is planning for the summit to take place in the fall. And I'd like to take a moment now to invite Jeff Lisa to join us and share just a few words about their project. Good evening, everybody, and um, thank you. Um, I need to recognize my wonderful friends at the IRI, an organization to which I've been involved for a couple of years for such a wonderful acknowledgement of my past work and future work using the support of many faith traditions, showing that there can be one voice among all the faithful to create a more loving world. I'm honored to also have the support of the entire CTS faculty in this, what I consider to be a forum that beckons my community with urgency. As a person who identifies as trans, I'm able to recognize a lack of education and some confusion about trans identities in my community. In my daily life, my experience dealing with folks in public often leads to some personal anxieties as my gender identity seems to be of little or no significance to these people, the people working in medical, social services, and for that matter, in public in general as I navigate through a culture that has always been accustomed to assigning gender as they deem it to be, rather than what the person being gendered desires to be seen as. Additionally, I felt the stares, heard the objections and witnessed the fear in myself as I confront everything from hostilities to the microaggressions and simply going about my way. My experience is not an exclusive one. As trans people face some sort of microaggression or even aggression every 45 seconds that they are in a public space. I was fortunate to attend a summit in 2019 at the VA in Iowa City, Iowa that focused on how the public might begin to see trans as legitimate. And in that context, how we might go about developing a community that works to alleviate some of the anxiety faced by trans individuals. My past seminary work has informed me that a primary source of hostility towards all LGBTQ people has, that has been installed in our world can be attributed to religion. I also recognize that some of my greatest supports in this journey have also come from religious leaders and CTS faculty members and within the interfaith organizations, both in Chicago and in my hometown. So, but only made sense to me to approach a summit in my community through the lens of interreligious engagement. I'm fortunate that I have the support of two local organizations, One Human Family and Quad City Interfaith, along with local churches and this very institute to come together and not only attempt to educate local religious leaders, but also to demonstrate how faith can come together in this event to educate the community, primarily medical, educational, and human service workers and how they might also begin to make a paradigmatic shift in their work. I have no illusions that this one day event will solve everything for folks like me, nor do I anticipate that we will change the minds of those who continue to live in a binary system with no intent of moving from that dynamic. But with this summit, 
I believe we can ignite the sparks to begin those conversations, the conversations that will someday create a world where all gender identities are considered worthy of respect, equal opportunity, and a celebratory inclusion in religious institutions. I wanna thank this institution for choosing this very important project to receive the Shaman Award. And I promise I will do my best to carry on the tradition of Rabbi Shaman that seeks to make the world a place where all lives are celebrated. Thank you again. Thank you, Jeff, Lisa, and please allow me to share congratulations on behalf of your entire CTS family on this award. I look forward to seeing your project materialize, to being a part of it, and I believe the summit will be indeed a fitting tribute to the life and legacy of Rabbi Shalman. Sincere congratulations, my friend. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, congratulations, Jeff, Lisa. We're very excited to, um, to see what comes. So thank you very much and congratulations once again. And now we are in for a very exciting treat. Um, it is time for a little poetry. And we are very <clears throat> fortunate to be joined tonight by Adara Hale, who is a, a spoken word artist and poet. Uh, Adara is born and raised Southside Chicagoan, poet and writer, as I mentioned. And she is also a current student at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, pursuing two degrees. She's an adamant supporter of community work, activist work, and the arts. And she's really phenomenal. Uh, she was an indie finalist in the 2019 Circa of uh, Louder Than a Bomb, if any of you saw that, and has performed at festivals such as Pitchfork and I Heart Halal. Uh, and she is, she is just a powerhouse. We were so fortunate to have her um, with us for the Black Voices of Transformation event that we did a, a few weeks ago. Um, and we just wanted to um, share you with Adara uh, again. So Adara, I will pass it to you and thank you so much for being here. Again, thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Um, the title of my piece is called The Absolutely True Diary of an Undercover Muslim. Hmm. I live my life in the crook of intersectionality. They call me triple threat. They play Jeopardy in my irreversible misery. I'll take mass incarceration for 500. What is being black? Murder for saying no for 300. What is being a woman? Menace to society in all countries for 400. What is being Muslim? And these are a few of my favorite things about myself. I am used to walking around feeling like a spy. Every time someone says grace at a table, I become a double agent. Whispering prayers to Allah, right after saying amen, the table instantly assumes I now have a license to kill, labeling me below seven, also known as Islamic, breaking bonds quicker than the number of people being killed right now during three minutes of this poem for wearing a hijab. Every day I see on the news that we are a threat. I hear on the bus that we cannot be trusted. I sit in a desk and feel the hatred of discourse in asylum. Why is everybody pretending that we don't need help? Even school zones are protected from Islamophobic bullets. A reminder why I don't wear my hijab or answer religious preferences questions on a survey. They come with target. And for saying this now, I now know that I have a few. Just because I don't share it when I'm with you doesn't mean it's not there and doesn't mean it isn't always invisibly trained in my head. I know there's a sniper within every American people. And there's nothing more disrespectful than the disrespect someone gives you when they don't know who you are or where you pray. Demonizes anything other than people. It's hard to act normal when someone is surprised that I could be Muslim. Like being black and woman isn't hard enough. I being beaten and abused because of your faith as well. Why people hate hearing me greet my sisters with assalamu alaikum. I've never heard a greeting change of room such as one spoken in Arabic. They call it terrorist time. Mas Maryam is where we trade our dialects, code switching our blessings, surrounded by gates that keep the spirit safe. Every time I go in, I'm scanned and checked. And every time I go in, I think of how I can just walk into a church, no worries of threats or bombs or guns. It's a respect for their religion, a sacred rule of their faith. 
unless that church is in Birmingham or Charleston. Somehow a black body devalues the word of God. Imagine how scary it is when you know you call your God a law and you are just as black as they were. It's hard to see the normalized genocide of Islamic people. Let me take a minute to talk about my concentration camp in China. Let me take a minute to talk about my tragic death in India. Let me say grace at the table for 200. What is in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the most merciful? All praise due to Allah, the Lord of all worlds. Thank you for having me, guys. <laughs> Beautiful, Adara, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ray. So I have the honor of introducing our speaker and his dialogue partner, but the first thing I wanna do is give a shout out to Aggie Pride, because Adara, I have a whole branch of my family, two generations, soon to be three, that are proud alums of a &T. So I will let them know how proud you have done them on this evening. So thank you so very much for that. I am pleased now to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Wajahat Ali, for this year's IRI Spring Lecture entitled, Invest in Hope, But Tie Your Camel First, a practical and spiritual look at confronting our multiple crises. As a Daily Beast columnist and former New York Times contributing op-ed writer, highly sought after political commentator, TED speaker, and award-winning playwright, Wajahat Ali is undoubtedly a jack of all trades, but across his many roles, one thing remains constant. Ali uses his platform to fight tirelessly for the social change we need in our country, and he isn't afraid to get personal while doing it. His upcoming memoir, Go Back to Where You Came From, and other helpful recommendations on how to become American, which should be out this fall, will share stories both hilarious and poignant of Ali's experience growing up as a Muslim Pakistani American in an effort to inspire a new vision of America's multicultural identity. Ali has given keynote speeches around the world, such as TED, the Aspen Ideas Festival, Google, the United Nations, and the New Yorker Festival. His writing appears regularly in the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Washington Post, and the Guardian. After his talk, Ali will be joined by our very own Susan Brooks Thistlethwaite. Dr. Thistlethwaite is President Emerita and Professor Emerita of Chicago Theological Seminary, an ordained minister of the United Church of Christ since 1974. She is the author or editor of 13 academic books, including two different translations of the Bible. And I certainly take my hat off to you for that, Susan, because I've been through the Bible a number of times and I can't imagine what it would be to write it all over again. So I'm going to take my hat off to you for that. Upon her retirement from CTS, she became a fiction writer, publishing three mystery novels and a fourth is in production. Thistlethwaite is also well a well-known media commentator and has written numerous columns for the Washington Post and the Huffington Post, as well as the Chicago Tribune. She now writes for her local paper and for the religious news service. For now, please join me in welcoming a new kind of public intellectual, one who is young, exuberant, optimistic, and funny at the same time, because we know public intellectuals take themselves too seriously so often. So it is good to have someone who brings a spirit of joy. So will you all please join me in welcoming Wajahat Ali. Thank you so much, Dr. Stephen Ray, for that amazing introduction. Uh, I think I owe you money. I'll, I'll, I'll send you Venmo or I'll put the check in the mail because you're an old timer like me, we're old school. Uh, thank you uh, to everybody who's joining us. Asalaamu Alaikum, Shalom, Namaste belated Passover and Holy uh, uh, Mubarak 
to those who acknowledge and celebrate. And for the Muslims, we have to fast in two weeks. So get prepared. Uh, many of you are looking at me right now. And you're all asking the same thing. Wait, is that Fareed Zakaria? I am not Fareed Zakaria. I'm also not Hassan Minaj. I'm not Ibu Patel. I'm not Riz Ahmed. I'm not Sanjay Gupta. And I'm not Mindy Kaling. I'm the guy that Kim got when the rest of them said no. So I'm proud to be here for IRI's eighth desperate last pick for keynote speaker because everybody else was busy and couldn't get on a Zoom call. I'm so honored that I actually wore a jacket and a tie for the first time during lockdown. And the second question you're probably asking right now is, is he wearing pants? And I will let you decide whether or not I'm wearing pants. Only God knows. God and I know whether or not I'm wearing pants, but I'll let your imagination be wild. Uh, in order to make this festive, uh, I decided to also give you amazing Lego sets. I would like all the old timers to admire the Ghostbusters Ecto, the 89 Batman Mobile, Mandalorian Razor Crest, Voltron Defender of the Universe, and also, of course, the evil eye to protect us all. There's also a Quran and a Bible there as well. So I'm, I've got all bases covered. And Dr. Stephen Ray gave a thumbs up to the Voltron. So thank you so much. Uh, I think there's a rule uh, for all religious communities. I think it's, uh, there's a verse in every single holy text, whether it's the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, whether it's the Quran that God says, verily thou shalt boreth an audience. And if thou shalt boreth an audience, thou shalt endeth in hell. I think that's in Corinthians. So I think it is, illegal and i think it is a sin to bore an audience and i've been told i have to speak for 20-ish quote minutes 20-ish minutes so for the next 20-ish minutes before me and susan do our little uh rope-a-dope i will try my best not to bore you oh i also also ashima told me that I, you guys also invited priyanka chopra my bad she apparently said no as well so next year inshallah priyanka will step up and you guys will get your first dibs okay now, there's no reason for any of you to know me. I don't have any delusions of grandeur. Uh, there's no reason to know me. I'm just an average uh, American kid. Uh, I'm a brown-skinned kid, the son of Pakistani Muslim immigrants who was born and raised in the Bay Area, California, Fremontistan, as I call it. And there was nothing really remarkable about my life, right? Um, my parents thought it would be hilarious to name their only kid Wajahat because, you know, to blend in America. They're like, what name would work? Oh yes, Wajahat. There's no keychain or Coke bottle with my name on it yet, but they said, let me, let me name him Wajahat because that's what the kids will like. And then also they decided not to teach me English uh, until I was five years old because who needs English in the United States of America? So I only knew three words of English when they dropped me off at Child's Hideaway Preschool. This is a true story. The three phrases of English were shut up because my mother used to say shut up, idiot because my mother used to say shut up, idiot. And if you guys grew up in the 80s, remember the Campbell Soup commercials, oh, oh, spaghettio? I couldn't speak English, so I used to say, oh, oh, pasghetto. Shut up, idiot. Oh, oh, pasghetto. All right, that's all I knew when they dropped me off at Child's Hideaway Preschool. I was the token brown kid. And when I first dropped, they dropped me off, they didn't tell me where they were dropping me off. They're like, just go. And I'm like, what's happening? I couldn't speak English. I was crying for like just the, the whole day I spent crying. My parents later said, we should have told you, but look, you turned out okay. So couldn't speak English, token brown kid, token Muslim kid. I was left-handed. And if anyone has grown up in Asian or Southeast Asian cultures, you know that there's only one thing you do with the left hand, and that requires the number two, and they try to beat out the left-handedness out of you. And so the true story goes that my grandmother used to hold my left hand behind my back, and my mom used to throw tennis balls at me, assuming I would convert to right-handedness and hold the tennis balls. Instead, I was stubborn, and Wasif Chacha, who was alive then, who was studying to become a doctor, came in and saw two women throwing tennis balls at a chubby little kid with the tennis balls bouncing off. And he's like, just let it go, let it go. He'll be left-handed. So I'm the only left-handed child of both sides of the family. And I was very healthy. And healthy is a very politically correct word uh, of saying big boned. And big boned, they used to say in Arabic, mashallah. And my, I was fat, I was also fat. And this was a time where there were no Dove soap commercials, right? There was no body positive images. It was just, it was like a relentless hazing. If you were the fat kid, every day was World War III. And so they used to make me wear husky pants. And if the, for those of you know, raise your hand if you wore husky pants, the joy and trauma of husky pants. They used to take me, it was used to be in Sears. So you have to walk beyond like all the regular pants, right? And there was a section called Husky for all of us big bone kids. And literally like, I remember it was like a 96 font on the backside of your butt 
just to brand you as fat, you used to say husky, you could see it from the sky. So this is all to say that I blended. I blended really well, but somehow I ended up graduating with an English major from UC Berkeley, and I became an attorney, and I ended up marrying the, a doctor who's brilliant and gorgeous and who used to be the high school cheerleader. So hashtag, it gets better. I love America, this is a great country, hooray. And so I just described to you a typical quintessential American story. It is a success story, right? Everything was going well. I went to an all boys Jesuit Catholic high school where I was a token Muslim. And for those of you who are Catholics, for those of you who are Jesuits, for those of you who've gone to a, a Jesuit school, either all boys or all girls, you know that secretly they kind of want to want to make you all into Jesuits. Sometimes it's, they succeed, other times they don't. I was a token Muslim. Every semester they used to teach us religious studies and who got the highest grade every semester in religious studies in all boys Jesuit Catholic high school with Jahat Ali, the Muslim, followed by Kalyan Neelam Raju, the Hindu, and Father Allender, just, there used to be a tear that used, used to come down his cheek as he used to read the, the grades, right? And so someone says, I wasn't the only Sears Husky kid. Nope, Jeff, Lisa, you and me, we empathize in many ways, we will bond. The, the, the struggle is real, my friend. And so uh, I went to UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm 20 years old, I just turned 21. I'm about to turn 21, I'm a senior, I'm undeclared, I'm, a, I'm a, a son of South Asian immigrants. There's only three occupations you can be, doctor, engineer, businessman, failure. Doctor, engineer, businessman, failure. I always knew I wanted to be a writer, but you can never tell anyone. But I'm like, all right, maybe I'll just go do law. I don't know, I'm undeclared. I'm about to be an English major. Uh, I'm a part of the Muslim Student Association. I'm 20 years old, I had lost weight. I think girls like me. Things are going well. And then the two towers fall and overnight, it becomes a pre-9/11 and a post-9/11. Post There's a fork in the time, uh, fork in the road for my generation, right? And for me and my generation, especially of young Muslims, that was a baptism by fire. All of a sudden, overnight, I'm asked to be the ambassador of 1.7 billion people and 1,400 years of Islamic civilization. On the drop of a dime, I have to be an expert on Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, a Sharia, Quran, Hamas, Hamas. Uh, Hakim Olajuwon, uh, like literally everything and anything, I have to be an expert and I cannot make a mistake. And if I make a mistake, not only will I be judged, but all people who look Muslim be, will be judged and our loyalty will always be held as suspect. Our patriotism will always be held as suspect. And no matter what we do, we have to condemn the violent actions committed by violent actors we've never met in countries we've never visited. And if we don't do it well enough, our moderation will always, always be held as suspect, right? And so what was interesting about that time was we were waiting for people to help us. I was a 20 year old, I'm a student leader of the Muslim Student Association, right? I don't know what I'm doing, I'm supposed to figure out my major. And all of a sudden we have all these women who wear the hijab, terrified. They're like, Waj, what are we gonna do? We don't wanna go out to school. We're, we've, we've heard these cases about assaults. What are we supposed to do? What are we gonna do about activism? I'm like, I don't even know my major. And the Avengers never came. Iron Man never came. We had to become the multicultural Avengers and step up. And I always say that that was a baptism by fire, but it was also, to quote another X-Men comic book analogy, that was also a danger room simulation for the rest of my life. It gave me the trainings for what I would inevitably end up doing. I had to become an accidental activist, an accidental ambassador, and I couldn't do it alone. I remember the first two groups that came up and gave us support, I'll never forget this. There was a sister, who was a Catholic, a white Catholic woman who said, how can we help? And also a representative and member of the Japanese American community. Because they said, this is a remake. We've been through this. You're gonna get hazed. We have some tools. How can we help? It took a multicultural coalition of the willing. And we had to step up. We couldn't put our head in the sand. And so we got out of our little cocoons. We realized, by the way, we're not white. We realized we're like the rest of them. We realized it didn't matter that we were in the suburbs. It didn't matter that we were the son of successful immigrants, hardworking immigrants. Overnight, we became them. We went from us to them. And to this day, I travel around America and I'm asked, why does Islam hate us? And when I go to Muslim majority countries, I'm asked to this day, why does the West hate Islam? And the whole time I'm wondering who is Islam and who is the West and how come they've never asked me out on a date, right? But it was an interesting intersection and cross-section 
where you realize we got to step up and we got to throw down because if we don't, not only are we screwed, but people who look Muslim are screwed. Because the first hate crime after 9-11 was of Babir Singh, a sick man who wasn't in New York. He was in Mesa, Arizona. He had a beer, he had a turban, and the white supremacist who killed him said, we have to come after you because I want to go after someone who brought down the towers. So he killed a man who looked Muslim, right? We worked hard. We created partnerships. We created alliances. Muslims became a little bit more progressive. We came out of our cocoon. We started supporting black rights. We started supporting Latinos. We started for the first time ever acknowledging LGBTQ Muslims and as allies. Uh, we thought there would be a victory. Obama became president, our Muslim brother. Thank you for voting for him. He is indeed Muslim. Psych, got you liberals, got you. He is indeed Muslim, Allahu Akbar, takbir. Obama became Muslim. We realized, look, it's not perfect, but this hellhole of this eight years of Bushism is done. And inshallah, God willing, there will be a new chapter. And then what happens? Trump, 2016, a slap in the face. What a slap in the face for the rest of us that millions of our fellow Americans were perfectly fine with the Muslim ban. Where millions of our fellow Americans were perfectly fine with the man who said Mexicans are rapists and criminals, who said that we come from shithole countries, who talked about urban warfare and urban crime, who said there were very fine people on both sides of Charlottesville, right? The first ad that dropped, his first YouTube ad that dropped, people forget, was all about the Muslim ban. The first executive order after he was elected was the Muslim ban. And then lo and behold, in 2020, 11 million more people voted for this man. And those demons of white supremacy that have fueled and helped co-create this country, they die hard. That black beating heart of white supremacy still beats. And what we're witnessing is the death rattle of white supremacy. And the death rattle of white supremacy has transformed into a death march. And so now you say, Wajat, we are witnessing climate change. We are witnessing a just completely dysfunctional government where white supremacy is mainstreamed and literally storms the Capitol and kills five people. We're witnessing Derek Chauvin's trial where most likely he might be acquitted. We are seeing people openly uh, do blood libel and old school anti-Semitism. Uh, Republican uh, elected officials like Marjorie Taylor Greene who talk about Jewish space lasers are given standing ovations by over half the House GOP. We're seeing Islamophobia and hate crimes run rampant. We're seeing white supremacy and white nationalism be globalized in here, in Hungary, in Poland, in France. And you're still telling me in the face of such horrors to have hope. Do you think I'm crazy? Was I born yesterday? I'm not a fool. How can you tell me to have hope? Oh, by the way, you still haven't mentioned this pandemic that has killed over 550,000 Americans, a low ball, and still we have a large part of Americans who are partying without masks, who give zero Fs about the health and security of our nation. And you're telling me to have hope. And I say, yes, especially now we need hope because I acknowledge that to have hope means to expose yourself to pain. Because if you have hope, that means you care. And that means you invest. And if you allow yourself to be vulnerable, you, allow your, you open yourself up to being betrayed, right? Because if you don't have hope, it's easier. What's easier than cynicism and apathy? What's easier than checking out? What's easier than being a spectator? What's easier than lobbing booze from the cheap seats? Told you so, that's what you get for being hopeful. Told you so, that's what you get for trying. Told you so, wouldn't matter anyway. Take care of yourself, give zero Fs, get by, take care of your family, enjoy it, it's all going to hell soon enough. But like the rabbi said, there's also a saying of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, where he said, even if you see the day of judgment coming around the corner, plant a seed. Even if you see the day of judgment coming around the corner, plant a seed. And I cannot, for one, to make it personal, as Dr. Stephen said, I make things personal, I cannot afford to be apathetic. I cannot afford to throw booze from the cheap seats. I have to throw down in the ring. I have to get bloody. I have to risk humiliation and pain. I have to be like Musa, Moses, and throw my staff in front of the Pharaoh because I have kids. I've lived a good life. I'm 40 years old. I've had multiple near-death experiences that Susan knows about, but I have three children. My wife and I have decided to have three kids, co-produce three kids, three adorable, beautiful children, Ibrahim, 
Nuseba and Khadija. And I sit here and I think about all these horrors of the world. And I think about my, my God, I decided to bring kids in this world. And I think about my role as a father. And uh, you know, most people, they wanna be the protagonist of the American narrative. When we were growing up, we're gonna be the astronauts. We're gonna be Indiana Jones. We're gonna be uh, in the DeLorean, right? But then you grow older and you're like, ah, maybe we won't be the hero. Maybe we'll be the co-protagonist. Nowadays, I think maybe my job is just to be a janitor. Maybe my job is just to clean up this mess and clean it up enough so my kids have some clean real estate. Other times, I think maybe my job is to be Hodor. This is an exquisite Game of Thrones reference for those of you who haven't seen Hodor, uh, the, the show. Hodor is this giant whose sole purpose in life, literally, is to sacrifice his giant body and pin himself against the door and to block the demons, the murderous demons that are about to come through. And his job is to sacrifice himself just so his friends have enough time to escape. Maybe that's my job. But other times I think maybe I'm lucky enough I can be a gardener. Maybe I can plant a seed. And maybe if I'm really lucky, maybe if I'm really lucky, inshallah, before my time is up, I can sit there in the shade with my children. And maybe if I'm super lucky, maybe that garden bears fruit and we can both enjoy it. Hopefully it's mangoes and pomegranates. I'm South Asian after all. And I sit there and I think about this, about having hope where so many of my fellow Americans are perfectly fine with white supremacy, where so many of my fellow Americans are perfectly fine with the Muslim ban, where so many of my fellow Americans refuse to acknowledge the humanity of immigrants, where so many of my fellow Americans are perfectly fine with a police officer choking a black man to death on camera. And I'm not a kumbaya person. I know we're not gonna win over everyone. I wanna, I wanna repeat this. I will not win over everyone and that's okay. But maybe I can win over the majority, right? Maybe I, I can win over the majority. And I always take it back to 1954 with the Brown versus Board of Education uh, case that ended segregation, right? Everyone thinks afterwards, oh, we became a post-racial society. Go back and see the video and footage of 1957, the Little, uh, Little Rock Nine, the nine girls who decided to go to an integrated school. What happened to them? The National Guard had to come out to protect these young nine black girls. If you look at the faces, the white faces of the people around them, scowling and angry, it's very easy to think, oh, they were devils. No, they weren't. They didn't have horns on their head. They didn't breathe sulfur. They didn't hold a trident. They didn't have clubbed feet. They didn't have forked tongues. They were people. Some of them, as time went on, recanted, repented. But some of them had that hate in their heart forever. We will not win over everyone. And that's okay. But I refuse to give up because I got kids. I refuse to do nothing. I will throw down in the middle of the ring with my superpower, whatever that superpower might be, and do what I can to push the ball forward. And I hear a lot of people say, well, Jahat, you write for the New York Times, you write for the Daily Beast, you're on CNN, who am I? I'm nobody, Wajahat, I'm nobody, I'm just a person who cares. I believe distinctly, let's run with the superhero analogy. I, I'm a child, as you can see, I, I read comic books. I believe God has given every single person one superhero power, at least. I think everyone has a role to play. I never underestimate the power of a single footprint, whether that's a suburban dad, a stay-at-home mom, whether that's a student. Each person, if they have the awareness, the intent, and the commitment to action, can throw down and have a positive impact on their community. Oftentimes, we've done the data, and they've shown that when the mom gets really committed, a mom, right, and passionate about a cause, it changes the family. One person can change a family, that person can change a community, that person can change generations. If you don't believe me, look at the people that came out, millions of people who came out for the Women's March, all average folks with average stories. Look at the millions of people who came out to protest George Floyd's murder, all average folks without superpowers. But look what we did. It was a multicultural coalition of the willing. Look how many of us came out, 80 million during a pandemic to say no to Trump and to say yes to Biden with the hopes of some positive change. The Avengers are not coming to save us. It is usually when we defer and outsource it to all of our problems to a, a leader, that's when we get an authoritarian. That's when we get fascism. When we decide to opt out completely in that space, we see an authoritarian and hate rise. But if we all step together, with together, into this space, if we all commit to throwing down our respective staffs, I believe that yes, we'll get some bloody noses, Yes, we'll get dinged, but it's still worth it. It's still worth it. And 
I want to say this finally, because I know Susan wants to talk about that, about having hope in hopeless times. We're nearing the two year anniversary of when my wife and I, my wife and I, Sarah, found out that my daughter, Nuseba, who was at the time two years old, was diagnosed with stage four liver cancer, hepatoblastoma. I didn't even know girls could get cancer at that age. And we were told that she needs life-saving chemotherapy and she needs a full liver transplant or she won't survive. This was two years ago. And talk about having hope in a hopeless situation. I used to sit every night and like Dr. Strange using the time stone in Infinity War, if you've seen the movie, I used to imagine all these different narratives and scenarios. And I used to imagine her death every night. And I had to imagine her death because I had to prepare myself mentally and spiritually for how I could be a father to Ibrahim. And by the way, my wife at that time had discovered that she was pregnant for the baby that was about to be on the way. And I always used to imagine a narrative of that somehow miraculously she would get a liver, she would survive, and we would sit there, eat her haagen ice cream, and goof off and play. I preferred that narrative. And lo and behold, with that tragedy, with the small skills that I had, I did what I could to promote uh, uh, information about uh, liver transplants and liver donors. And Georgetown told me that over 500 people, mostly strangers, stepped up to offer a piece of their liver to a girl they had never met, Nuseba, just because of her story, the power of a story. And eventually an anonymous liver donor stepped up, Shanza here, gave a piece of his liver for Nuseba. She lived, now she's thriving, she's about to turn five. Uh, she's uh, about to probably jump in through this door. She went to go get some snow cones at night. Uh, she's already had two haagen ice creams today. And she went, uh, she asked me to get the good butter for her recently. So now she eats good butter with her mac and cheese. I spoil her, but it took people it took a community to save this girl, right? And I'll say this, that even people who hate my politics, even people who hate all of my opinions, they offered to be her liver donor. How do I know? Because they messaged me. And they said, hey, I hate all of your politics, but I'm praying for your daughter. And that made me realize that, you know, not everyone's going to change, but some people can change. So how can I sit here and tell you not to have hope when all of us are surviving and alive during a pandemic? when my daughter who should have died has a brand new liver. And for people who thought Trump would win again, well, 80 million of us came out. And so I will tell you, as I hand it over to Susan, invest in hope, but tie your camel first because the Avengers ain't coming to save us. We have to save ourselves. And here's me tying my camel. Thank you for your time. Wajhad and Ali and I have known each other a very long time, 15 years. Yes, ma'am. I added it up. Uh, and we met because uh, we had both been asked to consult with the Center for American Progress. And so we shared an office where they stuck the religious people. Um, it was Waj and me and Bishop Gene Robinson. That's right. Shared an office. That's right. And um, uh, Bishop Robinson and I would vacate, Raj needed to pray, and it's ridiculous. So I, with consulting Waj, I went to the administration of the Center for American Progress and said, we need a dedicated prayer room. Mm -hmm. You've had this outreach to the religious community and thing, and you'd think I, the roof of the entire center nearly blew off and people outraged and we're not going to do this and so on and so on and they wanted the appearance of religion without actually having to i mean we could we could all be, be functionally secularists because you could walk across that door and be a secularist and um uh, my camel that i shared with the group uh, I was writing in 2011 in Egypt. Um, I was invited to speak uh, and give a speech on the role of nonviolence in uh, history as the first keynote of a conference on the Arab Spring. So I gave my talk and then I sat with the guys from Atpour who were um, 
uh, the people who brought down Milosevic. This is a brilliant group that do creative nonviolent. Mm. And they're so depressed. Mm. And as they turned, you know, as it turned out, they were right. Uh, and they said that despite their efforts, the uh, activists in uh, Egypt failed to make the religious case. So the Muslim Brotherhood gets elected rather than the uh, uh, pluralistic uh, democracy of the unions and the women's groups and everybody else who was at this conference. Uh, and the failure to make the religious case uh, was a source of literal pain to these activists who know how you make change. They know something about this. They got rid of Milosevic. I mean, that's a credential, right? Um, and when you say help, Adara, and religious people don't show up, that's what destroys Americans' faith in religion. As you know, everybody's going, oh my God, attendance is right. Attendance doesn't matter in the slightest. What matters is showing up. Right. That's what Raj is talking about, showing up. The, the donors or the potential donors showed up. We connected over this because my husband did the first living donor liver transplant ever successfully with other doctors, you know, <laughs> he did it best. <laughs> and uh, so I, we've been in touch over the years and I got in touch and I just kept telling Lodge about that little girl mm. who now had two kids of her own. Mm. Because part of hope is being able to imagine that right. there is that, that there is that possible future. And I told him that he had one thing going for him, and that is the first line of her college application essay was done. <laughs> when I was two, I had, you know, liver cancer. And, and this is possible. Right. It's possible. So I know that you cannot vote out white supremacy. You cannot. You got to vote, but without, I mean, you know, it, <laughs> the conservatives may be idiotic about Dr. Seuss or about, you know, some other cultural outrage, but one thing they get is it's got to be a cultural sea change. What, what the people at CAP thought was that it was policy. You change the policy, you change the country. And uh, I was asked by them to be on a panel uh, on climate change and to speak to uh, the role of the religious right um, in uh, you know, speaking against climate change. They didn't actually invite anyone from the religious right. I was kind of the Obama anger translator of <laughs> the religious right for them. So, the chief climate scientist said, when they, the religious right people, see what is happening to the planet with the rise of the seas and the fires, they will come on board. And I said, fire and flood? Are you kidding? They've got this, they got this taped. You've read any religious literature? It's fire and it's flood. You know, they got it. You have no idea how to speak to these people. And I got booed. Several people booed me for saying that. But if we are to effect the kind of sea change that has to happen in this country, we cannot neglect the cultural issues. And religion is a cultural issue. It is, it is a cultural issue. 
and we have to subvert. I mean, you you mentioned the demonic, and when you and I watch, we talked about be before this event. We talked um, about Hodar. You mentioned Hodar, right? Save us from the demons, right? Um, the demons we have today are are hugely imperfect demons. I mean, <laughs> I thank God Trump was as incompetent as he was. Right. I mean, there there's another fascist going to come along who will be more competent. Um, but even as there are imperfect demons who create havoc. The goodness is imperfect too. The goodness is imperfect too. I mean, we talk the language of intersectionality, of a, you know, and that is hugely imperfect. And people get paralyzed, in my experience, in movements of not, you know, if I don't have all uh, my my non-racist language right, and if I can't speak the language of religious diversity, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to do anything. And you have to take the risk. Now, you, you know, I do say, and da Dow Edgerton does, he said, that I say, shut up, she explained. Uh, and that's important. It's important to shut up and listen to what the people who've been kept out of the leadership positions, kept out uh, uh, of the public conversation have to say. But you got to jump in. You got to jump in, and this is what I'm hearing you saying. You know, without the coalitions, without the movements that uh, 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 create the surge in the other direction, it's uh, uh, impossible. We have to think of it as not as dippy as. Uh, uh, oh my goodness, three Dr. Seuss books got pulled, blah, blah, blah. but that what we're doing is affecting the cultural shift. Now, I just wrote a book chapter on the 53% of the white women who voted for Trump. The women on my mind, you know, <laughs> and how do you get at them? How do you get at them? And research shows that short term, religious language spoken by progressives does peel some of them off. It does, it peels some of them off, but not enough, not enough. And I think the other thing we are lacking is that larger horizon. I, I, I totally believe that the long-term strategy of the conservatives, the white supremacists in this country is apartheid. They want a small, white, rich bunch of guys to control everything and everybody else gets no vote. Well, that's not apartheid, I don't know what is. To effect the other change, what's our long-term strategy? What's our hope horizon, right? If, if, if horizon means anything in religious language, it's the thing we hope for despite the lack of possibility that might keep us up at night tonight. It's the college application essay when your baby has liver cancer. But, you know, I can tell you, that Dick spent years and years working on that idea that resulted in that first surgery. And of now it's standard, right? It's absolutely standard. Living donor liver transplants, which is a piece of the liver and liver, every, it all grows. The, the baby's liver grows, the adult's liver grows back. It's a perfect metaphor for the hope horizon because there were all those people who got in touch with you and said, yeah, I hate your politics, but your baby needs help. And if we can connect at that level, I think we can move forward 
with a hugely imperfect movement and its goodness will be hugely imperfect. But it's a good thing because we're up against incompetent demons who <laughs> are, you know, for whatever <laughs> else we can <laughs> say, they're, they're, they're not good, they're not that good, they're dangerous, but they're not that bright. So um, the, uh, I don't know where I am in my 20 minutes. Where am I, Kim? Uh, feel free if you two want to, um, if Waj, if you wanted to add anything to that and if you um, had any questions for him, uh, Susan, otherwise we can open it up to questions from the community, from those gathered. We have uh, some comments back, Waj. No, I, I mean, I agree. I, I, I appreciate the, you know, the, the, the reflection and also, you know, Susan, um, for, for those of you who are listening, uh, you know, she, right, right when it was, we were first at CAP and I remember she was, she had one of the offices, I one of the offices and I wanted a prayer room because I, I, Muslims pray like all the time. We pray like 500 times a day. I'm just kidding. We pray five times a day. Right. And so the reason why we want a prayer room is just so we can pray like quietly. So I don't make your life uncomfortable. I don't make my life uncomfortable. You won't be asking me why I'm doing Arabic Tai Chi. Right. And so Susan was like, yeah, we should get a prayer room. And I, this was 2011. And there were just like, like Susan's absolutely correct. This was like unheard of, like, oh my God, prayer room. But now I mean, it's a small metaphor, but it's a really good metaphor, right? In 2011, that's just 10 years ago, in a progressive think tank, Center for American Progress, in the nation's capital, that was seen as like, ah, oh, the damn monotheists annoying us again. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, but like nowadays, it's like, oh, yeah, meditation room, prayer room. It's those small acts of disturbances, right? The respectful persistence where people who don't have any superpowers just make small little overtures and you change the conversation. And, and a quick thing I'll say about culture right before we open into Q&A, uh, 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 because I think that'll be fun, uh, is we underestimate the power of culture and we underestimate the power of our religious stories and values. If you do not engage in this space, you cede this space. What's worse than being a villain is sometimes being ignored. And this space, as you all know, is populated then by people with very perverse political agendas who use our prophets as mascots. However, when we come in and throw down with a strong religious voice, because we have the authority as well, why cede that authority? Why cede that, uh, that narrative? Why cede it to people with perverse religious uh, political agendas? Then we can say, oh, wait, you're saying that this is for family values. You're saying this is for faith. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about family values. Let me tell you about Islam. And let me tell you how my religious and spiritual values that I'm not embarrassed about and I'm not ashamed about inform my values, which are to protect dreamers, to be against the Muslim man, right? To protect women's rights, to have expanded healthcare, to have uh, the stimulus package. And no one, like, people still underestimate how powerful that religious voice is. And the problem with progressives, I will say, before we open it up to Q&A, is I understand the allergy to religion. I understand the, the hives when it comes to religious communities, because unfortunately, this space has been hijacked by individuals who have used religion, uh, not as a shield, but as a sword. And so even if you mention religion and religious values, you go, we don't want to hear it. And I say, I don't care if you don't want to hear it. Millions of Americans are motivated by the religious faith. And if you want to move the needle, you better make space for us or else we're going to come into the space anyway and take over <laughs> a part of it a little piece of the playground because we're not going to give up our religious values and we ain't going to give up our progressive values and you need us to push and expand america to accommodate the rest of us but in order to do it you got to jump in the ring and that means being imperfect i'm glad you said that susan and that means being messy and that means being having your nose bloodied once in a while but in the absence of that you will have Trump 2.0. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm up for questions if you are, Susan. Absolutely, let's do it. I just saw a question pop up here on the chat. John Thomas. John Thomas. Uh, do you want to read it? Should I read it? Yeah, I'll read it. What is the role of humor in challenging the ideologies of both the left and the right? What response are you seeking to provoke? Uh, first of all, if you're attempting humor, laughter, 
uh, if you have just constipated faces, sometimes that's good too, right? Because it makes people think, but it's a very good question because humor, if used strategically, is a Trojan horse, a beautiful Trojan horse. They've said that when you make people laugh, it re releases endorphins in the human being. The human being naturally, regardless of your politics, becomes more open and more aware to otherwise hostile ideas. They become more receptive to it, right? And so if you can make people laugh, but you can give them some truth, which I think the best comedians do, you can help influence culture. And what culture does, it not only reflects society, it helps change society, right? You implement new thoughts and new ideas. And that joy that, as Wolf says, with laughter really helps bring about change. I'll give you a quick example. There were multiple factors that helped or helping mainstream LGBTQ communities. I am 40 years old. I grew up in the Bay Area. I can tell you hand over heart. Growing up in the Bay Area at Bellarmine as an 18-year-old, if you told me one of the most beloved daytime talk show hosts would be an out woman married to another woman, I would say, get the F out, pass the weed. I don't even smoke, but I'll smoke this weed. Uh, how LGBTQ communities did it in part was by actively playing a proactive role in culture. I remember the shift where Laramie Project was written as a play following the, the gruesome death, the hate crime of Matthew Shepard. And then that play was taught and is still taught in schools and performed. And it just shifted a little bit. Will and Grace shifted a little bit, right? Talk show, sitcom, ha ha, three, to, you know, three camera setup. Uh, Angels in America shifted a little bit. More out comedians shifted a little bit, little by little, each person using their superpower. So do not underestimate the role of laughter and humor, especially when it comes to religious communities. And I'll say this as a Muslim, the comment I get all the time from progressive, brilliant, Ivy League educated people, I'm talking, I'm talking about a specific story, a brown educated progressive New York agent who was courting me back in the day. He said, you know what really surprises me? I'm like, what? You're funny. And I'm <laughs> like, why is that funny? He goes, because Muslims, I just didn't think of them. I thought of them as I just, just, I'm like, I'm like constipated. He goes, no, 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 just dour, serious. Like th that's the image, serious stereotype. And then he started having a monologue with himself as he took me out to lunch, as he paid for this overpriced Branzino fish and grilled octopus I was eating for the first time. And just using me, he just monologued. He goes, why did I think that? Why do I think Muslims can't be funny? Huh, that's interesting. Muslims are human beings. They should be funny. Uh, but he was so used to the image of the dour, serious religious individual who had no joy, no life, no mirth, especially the Muslim, that when he read an article of mine where I was talking about these issues, but using some levity, it just completely booby-trapped all of it. So I know you asked me a simple question about humor, but don't underestimate personality, joy, laughter that is often missing from our spaces. And because it's missing from our spaces, it drives so many people away. I want to add to that just a little bit that, and uh, from a feminist body theology perspective, there's the, huh, there's the breath that mm. comes out. I mean, there's literally a physical reaction to humor. And right. when we were talking before uh, the call, Waj, uh, I shared that I'm worried about, mm. for myself, I mask. I double mask, actually, I still do. Uh, and I would smile at people when I'm out and about. You can't, you know, what do you do with your eyes? You know, it's very nothing. And uh, I, I see another person coming at me down the street and I leap to the side, mm. you know, I get away. And the, I think the costs of this not only the social isolation, but the public isolation. I mean, you said when we were talking about that, we haven't even begun to calculate this. No. Not begun to calculate this. But paying attention to the bodies we lost, the families that are aggrieved, but then to the massive ruptures in the coalitions themselves, the, what, what builds human community. Um, or even hugging, I, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm so lucky I got double vaxxed, you got double vaxxed, but I mean, who do we hug? Do, uh, do we hug? Do we wear the mask? Uh, are we allowed to go to parties? How about anti-vaxxers, right? Uh, the, and, and we are social creatures, human beings are social creatures. They always travel and tribe to the point where back in the day, 
if you were um, excommunicated from your tribe, that was a death sentence because you wouldn't be able to survive. Yeah. And we're seeing the social isolation and numerous studies now have caught up. Loneliness causes death. Mm -hmm. And so when people say, oh, having hope is silly, it's ridiculous. I'm like, sometimes that's all that people have, literally. They yeah. have, they maintain some hope that when the page turns, it will bring with it a new story, that the tragedy yeah. will finally end, right? And I think hopeful, hope by itself then becomes a fantasy but hope, I think you were talking about this, Susan, you know, faith sometimes needs something tangible. You need something to a hook, right? Faith yeah. alone is not enough for people just because we're people. We're like, what's the point of faith when all of us just keep suffering and dying? So you, you also need God to show you some wins. And I think, and I think we have to remind ourselves and articulate the wins that are present in every day. And those might not be the vaccine. That might not be Biden's win, but that just might, you know, that might be that person who holds their head up high despite enduring so much tragedy and, and, and still succeeding with respect. That's hope. That must mean the Muslims who threw down and said, when you tell me to go back to where I came from, nope, I'm gonna go to work. That's hope. When you try to knock down women, but they say, nope, we're gonna come together and we're gonna march, that's hope. I think these, these moments that might be seen as mundane, or if it's a priest who comes out and just posts something on Facebook in honor of trans people or says, you know, my religious values say that I have to help the dreamers. That's all just a post Facebook post. It's nothing more. It's a tweet. That myself, my friends, is hope. And that's something tangible that I think we should not underestimate um, as we move forward, especially in light of the fact that 550,000 people have died. Like you mentioned, we have been ruptured in ways that will be, that are profound and will be studied for years to come. And many of us are still suffering from loneliness. Aj, I wanted to jump in. I appreciate so much. This is fantastic. I appreciate it so much. But President Ray put a question in the chat um, that I think really sort of teases at this idea of what we mean about hope and how, what, if, what, what if we don't have hope? Mm -hmm. um, President Ray, I wonder if you, you would go ahead and just articulate your question. I know it's in the chat, but I think it's a really important one. I will just read it, otherwise I will extrapolate uh, too much. Um, so Hodor may not have had hope as he stood at the door, just a dogged determination that those who did have hope mm. could escape and so that they might live to fight for tomorrow. How do we honor those whose hope is spent, but not their determination to protect those who still have hope as they fight for a better tomorrow? Great question. Uh, I would say by tying your camel, by showing up, by showing up, showing up and showing out because you, you can say, because there's so many hoders, right? There, and we've been hoder before in our lives, I think, but there's so many hoders who said, I'm spent. I did what I could. This is for the rest of you. I don't have hope for myself, but maybe, maybe I'll allow myself to have uh, this sacrifice is, is, my, is, my, is my Hail Mary pass, right? And so if you want to honor their memory, and if you want to honor, as you said, their, their determination, then you have to step up. Uh, and I, you know, at the end of the day, who am I to say to people who have suffered and endured challenges that I have not, that you must still have hope? You know, everyone has their own unique challenges and God knows best. But what I can do with my privileges, which are immense, and the one privilege that I have is I survived. I'm here speaking to you during a pandemic. I'm the lucky one. Uh, how can I now have that awareness and not do anything with it, right? And what I always, I always tell people this is you don't have to do anything. Let me repeat this. You don't have to do anything. You can tune out, watch Netflix and chill, uh, eat your ice cream and give zero Fs. That's fine. Uh, everyone has a free will. But for the rest of us, if you do have that in awareness, then I would say you honor the memory and the dog determination and our ancestors by showing up and at least trying, at least get in the ring and try. And anyone who gets in the ring and tries, my respect for them eternal. Hmm. There's another uh question in the chat, um, and maybe it can be a brief, uh, um, but uh, do you think it'll be, and I think this is an interesting question about religion where we are right now, especially with, um, with, with the past of Trump, but do you think that it's important that Joe Biden goes to church? 
and what role that plays. Uh, Kim says, be brief, which means uh, shut up. Uh, you've gone over. No, not me. You were totally fine. No, no, no. I just thought maybe that we, there's a couple know. other questions. We are no, totally fine. Like, Listen, Freed. We didn't hear the, <laughs> thing, the monologue. Uh, Please at uh, length answer that question. You know, I, 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 my take on this is I'm happy that, look, if Biden is religious, which he seems to be, and he's a Catholic president, and, it, and faith is important to him, go to church. That's fine. And if he wants to flex like that, uh, politically, strategically, I'm very happy uh, that he flexes like that with his religious values, because why should he cede his faith? Why should we cede our faith and progressive values to the right wing? Uh, and so good. If he wants to go to church, go to church. Be proud of it. We have religious freedoms in this country. And if your faith has helped him, as he has said, go through immense pain and tragedy, which it has, wonderful. Share that. And that will connect with so many Americans. I cannot tell you, how, and Susan was right, the messaging problem of the progressives is, is profound. When it, so many Americans, Muslims, I've heard this from Catholics, from Jews, Christians, they don't speak in a religious language. They look down on us. They look at us like we're idiots. Well, when you have the president of the United States himself, whom 80 million people voted for, say, I go to church and my faith helps me, you will win over some voters. Yes, and it, the non-hypocritical faith. Exactly. Non-hypocritical faith. Here. Yeah. But they, you know, <laughs> there were people like, oh, look, Trump holding a Bible upside down. And <laughs> they, <laughs> they, priests in the church were just ballistic. But faith is one of the easiest things to fake. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I think it's uh, how you walk the walk rather than how you talk the talk or, you know, go to the, uh, go to the church and, uh, and perform hypocritical religion. I mean, I think that's yeah. sabotages it for a lot of, for a lot of people who serious yeah. people go, that's what, that's what it is. It's just fake performance. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Susan. Are there other questions? We'd love to get some new voices in the chat. Are there other people who um, might Are want to- Are you guys to... bored? Do we bore you? I made a promise <laughs> to bore you. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or if you're too shy, you can throw it in the chat and I will read the question to Raj. I for think there's one that you. just came in. Great. And that is, what are meaningful ways for those with faith and without to learn from each other about shared liberation? Great question. Uh, first and foremost, I would say, uh, show up. I would say show up without preconditions, show up without a litmus test. Oftentimes in these spaces, you, in order to talk, you need to have an agreement and diplomatic maneuvers to talk. It's hilarious. It's so funny. That's where humor comes in. He goes, I'll talk to you, but first you have to check this, uh, you have to check off all these boxes to make, to make you kosher or halal to talk to, right? And so when I've seen that is, why don't we just talk? Like, why don't we just like, like keep the checklist on the side and if any look, every community has its challenges. I always joke about what I call um, hummus theology, which mm -hmm. is like the weak sauce interfaith stuff. We're like, I like hummus, you like hummus, we like hummus. Don't we all like hummus? Hummus. And uh, let's not talk about Israel Palestine. Let's not talk about monotheism. Let's not talk about our conflict. Let's just talk hummus. Would you like hummus? Fool, there's fool. And I'm just like, I don't have time for hummus theology anymore. But but I will say this: in some communities, and I've gone to the Midwest, I've traveled, that's all they have. So if all you have at the beginning is I like hummus and you like hummus, right? And that's literally the breaking of the bread that gets you in the room to talk to each other face to face behind social media screens and acknowledge each other's humanity, do hummus, right? If all it takes is you picking up the phone and saying, I want to come speak. Easy thing that people can do. Hi, I'm an ally. I am not Muslim, but I'm really concerned about the Muslim and Islamophobia. And I see some of it coming from my community members as well. I wanna be armed with a type of language and knowledge and relationships where I can go back and tell people this isn't right. Can I come talk to you? Can I come visit your mosque? Vice versa, right? These small gestures that an average human can do can literally create the seeds of, of, of change. I just was interviewing someone earlier today in the Midwest, Kansas. She said, when I was trying to do interfaith, she's Muslim, Arab, and reach out to Jewish partners, right? I got no Muslim who would support me. No Muslim. I just said, F it, I'm going to do it myself. They invited me. I went and talked. I have one chapter. I started with one chapter of Sisterhood Shalom. 
with whether you like it or not, Sister Head of Salom and Shalom, I'll give you an example. Now there are five over two years, right? And it just started with one person. So I would say, Shima, don't underestimate the power of one person reaching out in good faith. Don't wait for the Avengers. If you're seeing in your community that no leader or elder or imam or, or, or a priest or rabbi is doing it, you got to step up. Thank you, Aj. That's great. And I have to just say, I have to add in, Lisa, Zook and I are nodding and smiling at each other because this was one of our big conversations when we started the website with the IRI was to not have it go beyond hummus. I think we actually had the words beyond hummus. Uh, and so we are- we Great are minds, also, Lisa. <laughs> we're interested in getting beyond hummus, but I love what you said that, that if all you have is hummus, then let's just do hummus. Of course. And then let's all work to get past hummus into the deeper, um, the deeper work that needs to be done. Uh, there is a question from John Thomas in the chat. Have we recovered from 9-11? Or does it continue to shape and distort the political and religious dialogue in the U.S.? Have well, we covered, recovered from 9-11? Mm -hmm. uh, the war on terror is now taking place on the suburban streets. Uh, the world is our battleground uh, with the war on terror, the endless war on terror, which has become the war on extremism with the creation of the Patriot Act, with the creation of DHS, with the militarization of our local and state police. You saw it unleashed on the streets of Portland in the summer. Uh, you saw the Muslim man being justified as like extremists and terrorists, and yet 15 of the 19 hijackers came from Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia was not on the terror Muslim man. Uh, in fact, Trump then went to Saudi Arabia and did a curtsy uh, for the king uh, because they have lucrative deals, right? Uh, it has influenced the conversation and has influenced the language. It has helped mainstream Islamophobia. Love has gone intersectional, but so has hate. Uh, that caravan wasn't just undocumented immigrants, it was also Middle Eastern terrorists, remember that? And so the war on terror is here to stay. We survived it, we lived through it, but the young generation has grown up in the shadow of the war on terror, the war on extremism, right? And so it has greatly influenced uh, everything, even our foreign policy, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, hello, hello. Uh, and so I do not think we've recovered from it, but I do think, one thing I'll say, the positive thing, is we're about to enter the 20th anniversary of 9-11, believe it or not. It's going to happen in a couple of months. And we are finally able to have some conversations that we never had before. And specifically, some of the protagonists or co-protagonists of the American narrative whose story was villainized or sidelined, 20 years on, finally, America has the appetite to finally say, huh, I wonder how the rest of you experienced 9-11. We couldn't have that conversation 15 years ago, even 10 years ago. Tell me more about Muslims and Sikh and, and Middle Easterners. Tell me more about the civilian casualties. Tell me more about white supremacy and racism. Tell me more about how the war on terror has now like expanded and, and, and eaten up our civil liberties. We can finally have that conversation. So John's like, I guess, no. You asked me for his- <laughs> Let me just add that I think, and in a legacy you can see right in front of you is that the word terrorist still seems not to be able to be applied to white guys attacking the Capitol. That's right. I mean, how much more evidence do you need of terrorism? But, you know, that insurrectionist, you know, how many syllables do you need to say right. terrorist? But it's still associated. It wedged itself into that box of Muslim and terrorist and I mean, one can only imagine what would be happening in this country should everyone who attacked the Capitol then Muslim. Yeah. So, you know, the, the rhetoric uh, 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 hijacking, I mean, it is, a, it is a mental hijacking that may be being eroded slightly around the end. I mean, I'm hoping that the new Justice Department is not confused about who the real terrorists are amongst us. I think they are not. Um, but I think that is a big time legacy, John. And that shapes really. culture, that shapes imagination, that shapes our stories, that shapes how we see and view fellow Muslims. We see them as terrorists. That increases hate crimes. If you don't believe me, uh, real quick, I'll give you an example, something we have to acknowledge. The stunning increase in anti-AAPI hate, Asian American hate. Last March, President Trump decided to use the words Kung flu and China virus. And from March to December, 3,000 incidents of hate are recorded against AAPI members. This does not happen 
in a vacuum. Yeah. Uh, we uh, uh, have a time, I think, for one more question for Waj, if um, somebody would like to, uh, and if it's not a question, it also might be an open opportunity to um, reflect on something that you're taking away. I personally love the um, not waiting for the Avengers. I think I think that that is really powerful, Waj, and you know that we all have our own superpower and to use that superpower. Um, so I thought we could just open up if anyone, and if there's any responses both to the spoken word or to um, Jeff Lisa or Shelby Perez as well, if anybody wanted to um, throw in anything or ask any questions, we, we could open it up for one more um, question. I also accept yeah. fatwas and rants. Uh, <laughs> or complaints, if you, complaints. yeah. <laughs> but thank you all for sticking around. I know how difficult it is to do a Zoom on a Tuesday night, but you guys stuck around, you guys listened. Thank you for being an engaged audience. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, wow, we're so happy to have you. Do you want to mention your book? Come back to the book. Terrific uh, my book, real quick. Okay, the book. Um, the book's coming out January 2022. They accepted it for publication. It's my first book. It's called Go Back to Where You Came From and Other Helpful Recommendations on How to Become American. It's a 16 word title that they accepted. The book is a Trojan horse, where it's written kind of like as a how to memoir to become American. There's 10 steps, but it's a very culturally specific story of the last 20 years, hopefully animated by a greater purpose and how it's connected to the American story. Um, and you will learn a lot about me uh, for better and for worse. I hope it's funny. My wife really likes it and my parents really like it. So that's a win. Um, but uh, I hope it pushes things forward. That's the hope. Thank you, Ajahn. You definitely have pushed things forward for us tonight and we are um, so grateful for that and for your presence here with us tonight and just being your full person and your, you know, you're just, it's really exhilarating to, um, to share this with you and, uh, and what you bring to the table. Thank we'll, you guys. Thank you so much for inviting me. This was fun. Uh, Stephen, Dr. Ray, would you like to just uh, uh, close us out tonight? Yes, I would like to once again, thank you all for joining us for this wonderful conversation and dialogue. Um, I think what I would also like um, to do is to thank you to our speaker, Wajahat Ali. One of the things that um, spending time with you this evening reminded me of the great sort of, um, uh, um, uh, for lack of a better term, orators that turned history through be their ability to take both the poignancy of the moment and the gravity of the moment and speak to the deepest things within us, which I believe are our ability to have humor, but more importantly, our ability to bring that to the service of deep faith and deep religion. So thank you so much. And I also want to thank my beloved colleague, President Emeritus Susan Thistlethwaite for joining us this evening. Thank you for the wonderful work uh, that you've done through the many years and um, just to both of you for creating a wonderful opportunity for this dialogue. And I'd also like to thank Lisa Zook and also Ken Schultz for the wonderful work they've done with the IRI because the Interreligious Institute is a significant driving force in what CTS is becoming. So I thanks to all of you. And once again, friends, thank you for joining us and I hope to see you soon at further events uh, here at CTS.